This week, you read about the instructional design model, ADDI, and you saw graphics depicting two other models, Dick and Carrie, and a situated ISD model. There are many different models to choose from. Each serves as a guide to ensure that you think through your learning goals, who your students are, and how you're going to ensure that your students get to your learning goals. Let me try to put this new terminology into context for you. Lesson planning versus instructional design. If you're a classroom teacher, you saw connections between these models and whatever process you use for lesson planning. You may also be saying to yourself, Addie's great in principle, but I don't have time to follow all these steps for every lesson I plan. I have two responses. First, if you adopt one of the instructional design models, it will surely slow you down at first. But your students' learning outcomes and the speed with which you can do the process will get better and faster respectively. Second, there has long been a difference between typical instructional design and typical classroom teaching that's worth noting. Instructional designers are usually creating learning objects to be used by others in teaching and learning. A learning object might be an online course design, a textbook, an instructional video, or a curriculum. Instructional designers go through a rigorous process of designing, testing, and redesigning because once their learning object is complete, their opportunity to change it is lost. Classroom teachers do some of their redesign on the fly while with their students. They adapt and improve their lesson plans every time they use them with a new group of learners. As our teaching incorporates more online learning, the distinction between the classroom teacher and the instructional designer is becoming blurred, and both can benefit from sharing knowledge and practices used by the other. Let's talk about Gagne's approach to instruction, as his book will be the text that we use most this term. Gagne is very concerned with cognitive processing. This is a cognitivist view of learning that focuses on the internal processes by which the learner transfers incoming information into stored memory. As a writer, he is concerned with chunking his information and making it possible for you, his learner, to retain it. Some of you will find his style of writing very comforting. You will like the way he breaks his chapters into sections and subsections and lists. You'll see the logic behind his categories. For others, his numbered and bulleted lists will seem overblown and complex you will feel you need to me memorize them and you'll be unsuccessful. It's not necessary to memorize. It's not even necessary to agree with all the ways that he categorizes learning and knowing. Gagne is a leader in the field of instruction and design and his is only one perspective, get the gist. And through discussion and the items that I highlight for you weekly, you'll make meaning of the important bits. Then each week, you'll have an opportunity to apply those important bits to your design project. Each chapter will guide a step in the design of your mini course. Here are a few of the resources in chapter two that I'd like to highlight. You might want to copy or print the following for future reference. I've attached these pages in a digital form for easy reference. On page 22, there's a table with a nice summary of the ADDIE components. On page 30, there's a list of Gagne's nine events of instruction. While I don't feel this is an exhaustive list, his nine events are often referenced in the literature. On page 39 is a graphic of the Dick and Carey model of instructional design. In your design project, you'll be following components from both Addie and Dick and Carey. What about the other readings? 
Behaviorist and cognitivist approaches to instructional design provide guidance and excellent techniques for teachers and designers. Behaviorists provide us guidance about the importance of frequent feedback and clear measurable performance objectives. Cognitivists give us practical techniques for activating a learner's prior knowledge and helping learners retain new information. The Lynn and Colin articles contribute the constructivist view of learning. By providing instruction within context and with hands-on and social components, learners are able to make personal meaning of new information and bring higher order thought processes, that is, beyond memorization and recall, to the learning process. Matt Yeagley asked this week if these approaches are mutually exclusive. To my mind, the answer is a resounding no. Teachers and learners benefit from the research findings of these three schools of thought. I agree with Barbara that we can and probably should use all of these approaches depending upon the nature of the content we are teaching, our learning goals, and the students we have in any particular class. In the coming week, we'll be exa examining learning outcomes. We'll watch a provocative video that asks us to consider what it means to understand. Pay close attention this week to Gagne's five learning outcomes and ask yourself how do his outcomes relate to what Perkins and Blythe tell us about learning for understanding. We'll start your design project this week, so head on over to the wiki and get started. I'll be in touch and don't hesitate to ask.